Hello. Satyajit Ray is widely considered one of the top film directors worldwide. He's an original GOAT, greatest of all times. Born in 1921, Ray came a family of educated people. His paternal grandfather and father were writers. And one could say writing was in his genes. When Ray was only three, his father died leaving Ray's mother alone to take care of the family. When Ray was about 20, he joined Viswabharti University in Shanti Niketan, which was founded by Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore. Many of you may remember that Tagore was the first non-European to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. It was at Shanti Niketan that Ray acquired an appreciation for Indian art for the first time. Ray started shooting on his first film in 1952. It was based on a 1929 Bengali novel and released in 1955 as Pathar Panchali to critical acclaim. For the next 40 years, Ray made several films, most of them based on Bengali or non-Bengali novels. He also wrote the script and composed the music for many of his films. He also wrote essays and books, including an autobiography of his early childhood years and a memoir about his early filmmaking years. Most people do not know this, but he also designed typefaces for Roman scripts, a reflection of his early training as a graphic designer. He was indeed a man of many talents. Two other interesting things about Ray that most people don't know. He created a popular fictional detective, Faluda, an Indian version of James Bond. Another fictional character he created was Professor Shantanu, a scientist who was at the center of Ray's science fiction series. Ray passed in 1992 at the age of 70, just days after receiving an Honorary Academy Award, AKA Oscars for lifetime achievement. When he died, many international newspapers carried his obituary. His obituary in the in Independent asked, who else can compete? Frankly, for many filmmakers worldwide, there was no competition to Ray's filmmaking style. There are now many, many books about Ray, some by Indian authors, others by authors from outside India. Today we'll meet one such author whose book on Ray includes glimpses of a 20 year long, long correspondence with the acclaimed filmmakers. Thank you for joining us. Namaste, mm -hmm. bonjour, shalom. Welcome to our interview today with Dr. Shoma Chatterjee, author of Satyajit Ray, Frame to Frame. Dr. Shoma Chatterjee has a PhD in history and has written several books on films and people associated with films. I encourage you to check out other, other books, particularly the one of Suchitra Sain, a famous actress from Bengal. Shomaji, welcome and thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you for calling me. I'm honored. I'm feeling very happy. Uh, other than those technical glitches which are we face every time, at least I face every time. And thank you, Vishal, for coming in and agreeing to interview me. <laughs> thank you. And uh, let's begin with our first question. Can you give us yeah. a 30 to 40 second elevator pitch of your book? Uh, see, uh, since this is the 101st year of Shruti Yutrai, he's 101 years old now. Uh, uh, books on Ray are coming out of our year, years. Every day you have find a book on Ray. And his own works are also being translated in different languages and coming out every now and then. So I was thinking about my publisher, Vita Sar, Renu Kaul Verma. She asked me whether you can give me some good manuscripts. She didn't suggest Ray because I, I didn't also know that... Uh, uh, what uh, what am I going to write on Ray? Because I had already written a very big book on Ray earlier. 
that is in 2017. That was on a different subject. So what I did is I tried to think about uh, areas which were not covered at all and uh, whether I could focus on them. About that also I was doubtful. I was wondering whether I should focus on things which uh, people do not relate to with rape. Uh, for example, hunger or masculinity or femininity or food that is that comes under hunger and uh, uh, of course uh, how uh, what struck me uh, through three of his films is that how he has tried to depict that prostitution is no longer a ghettoized profession but it has entered into the mainstream so he tried to bring it out it suddenly occurred to me while i was watching i my, my main education in uh, writing on cinema is watching films again and again and again so uh, that is how I suddenly pounced on this hunger, then the sex worker thing, then Feluda, where he, it's a crea character created by Shwetoyi Trai, but the character is as big and as alive, as, and as three-dimensional as Ray himself was. And he outlives Ray because he's a character, so he's eternal. And I enjoyed, my thing is that since I don't write really for money, uh, publishers don't pay, if you're a writer, you'll know that. <laughs> so uh, I've written 30 books, but I can't show it in terms of any bank balance. Uh, but I'm very happy writing what I do. And I thank Renu also very much because uh, with this, she has published three titles of mine over a period of 10 or 12 years. So I'm very grateful to her for that because whatever I say, she more or less always says yes. And then I start writing. And so that is what about uh, my writing thing, what you wanted and elevated and about this book, the USP. I don't know whether this book has a USP. I think it is for the readers and the critics to decide whether it has a USP or not. But I think that if we were to talk about USPs, it takes uh, Ray out of his art or his literature or the, the work on camera, the work on sound, the work on music and studies uh, little known factors which have not been focused earlier, you know. For example, his dealing with the Dalit identity in Prem, Prem Chand's story, Sadgati, that also I've dealt with. Then uh, Shunin Ganguly's Pratip Dondi, he has slightly changed it, but it's a beautiful film. So for Ray, what I feel is that the literature and cinema can be uh, taken to be two distinct identities if one is a writer and the other is a director. It is not necessary that the two should coincide. That is my opinion. Uh, if it coincides, it's well and good, but if it doesn't, for example, in Charulata also he has taken uh, big liberties, but uh, if we can accept it at this time, I don't think there's anything wrong. So Shomaji, we'll come to the multi-dimensions of uh, Satyajit Ray in a few minutes, but let me ask you this. The book includes correspondence or copies of correspondence between Satyajit Ray and you, which mm -hmm. was very impressive that you corresponded with him for several years. How was he as an individual? Uh, I knew him uh, face to face. I learned about him very little. It was more through letters. Uh, what happened is I fell in love with Kanchen Janga. All right, surprising. Not Pathir Pachali, not Opera Jito, but Kanchen Janga. I saw it three times, I think three days consecutively uh, at Lotus Cinema in Bombay. It doesn't exist anymore. And I was so fascinated by the factor of real time equal to cinema time because uh, the situation, the things that happen in Kanchen Janga happen over one hour and 15 minutes or so. And the film is also of one hour and 15 minutes. So there was a, a, a complete equation, the synth, the synthesis between real time and cinema time. And the way it has taken and the way that Kanchenjunga, the mountain has been taken both as a metaphor and as a physical reality and a cinematic reality uh, appealed to me so much. I was only about 17 or 18 at that time. I was not even a graduate, I was a college student. I, I didn't even ever, ever dream of becoming a film critic or a film journalist at that time. But I only loved cinema. I was obsessed, I was passionate about cinema. I loved it so much that I went on hunting for his address, residential address. And it was a bit tough, but I got down to it and I said, I'll write a letter. And those days we didn't have typewriters or computers. So mine was a handwritten letter. And uh, uh, very surprisingly, he wrote back again in his own hand. 
in his own handwriting. It was a very simple letter, small letter. I said, I, was, I fell in love with your, I'm very fond of reading. I'm doing my economics honors. And he said, what a surprise. I'm, I was also doing my economics honors, but I quit it halfway through because I got addicted to cinema. So, and uh, it was a very short thing. And I had asked him also that uh, his father, Shukumar Roy, had, has written a beautiful book called Pagla Dashu. Now, Pagla Dashu <coughs> is a fictional character uh, it's based on in a school, on in a school environment, nothing about home or family or anything like that. Uh, about a group of boys in two, three different classes. And among them, there is one guy called Pagla Dashu. Everybody calls him Pagla Dashu because they think he's Pagla. But he's not Pagla at all. He he behaves as if he is very eccentric, but actually he uses his eccentricity as an excuse to be uh, you know, as an excuse uh, to be pardoned of many pranks, uh, practical pranks. He used to play practical pranks. And it was very appealing. You can go on reading those small skits a uh, hundred times over, but you'll never get bored with them. Now, I was, uh, when I had read Pagladashi when I was very young, at about 14, 15 years, I, uh, 14, 15 years old. And uh, I felt that why doesn't anybody make a film on Pagladashi? So uh, he wrote uh, my answer. I asked him that, why, didn't, why do, doesn't it occur to you to make Pagla Dashi? It was written by your father. And you have illustrated the book also. Beautiful illustrations done by Ray himself. So uh, why didn't you make a book? So he said that it is set in a school and it has absolute critique. It is an absolute critique of the school education system, of the school system, of the education system, of the discipline that is there of everything, of the teachers who teach, somebody goes to sleep and suddenly gets up and start caning the children, uh, thinking that they're not attending. But he's also sleeping and they are playing knots and squares and all that. So he said uh, it would create a problem because uh, it would be a direct attack on the education system. So I was scared to do it. I didn't do it. I hope somebody else does it. But that, that is there in that letter, in the first letter. And uh, he said that uh, the the, the polka of cinema bit me. The polka is insect. So I, I was bitten by the insect of cinema. And so I quit my studies. And uh, I didn't feel like making Pagladashu because uh, it would create sense of problems and all that. It, 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 uh, uh, there's a very subtle political critique of the education system. Very subtle. Because every uh, on the surface, it's all mischief and not in it. It's not only Pagladashu. There is, there is a small sketch of a teacher. There's a small sketch of the headmaster. There's a small sketch of other boys. There's a small sketch of a skit being rehearsed for the school annual function in which Pagladashu has not been taken at all. Uh, so these were the things. It was not a very long letter, but at, in my family, my father, my mother, we were all avid fans of Ray. They were all very happily, pleasantly surprised that he uh, he got up and wrote the letter in his own hand. And even uh, the envelope was uh, written by him himself. And uh, the other day I went to uh, interview his son about his childhood memories of his father. And he said, that my father made it a point not to type letters, not to ask somebody else, only the posting later on, he did not do it himself. When he was not famous, he used to even post the letters himself. But then he would tell us to post, even if he said that somebody is going to type it for you, he said nothing doing, nobody's going to type it for me. I'll do it myself. So I got about four or five letters in all, but I lost them because we shifted from Bombay to Calcutta. So these are the ones which you see in the book are there. And he was very friendly with my mother. My mother was an avid, my mother was another different person, not like me. She was a gate crasher who would go anywhere and everywhere people are not allowed. And she would nicely make friends with everybody. So with especially the writers. And Shatuitra became a friend and she corresponded with him a bit, but he wouldn't answer much because her handwriting was very bad. So probably he couldn't read her letters. And then once he wrote to me that your mother left a hundred rupee note in her uh, spectacle case. She left the spectacle case. So shall I send it by money order? And he sent it by money order. My mother had forgotten all about it. So these are the memories I have. And uh, sadly, when I became a journalist and he knew that I am now a journalist, of course, I was budding that time. Whenever I would approach him for an interview, he would always say, no, 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 no. You know me already. What is there to say? You know everything that is written about me. And I felt very sad because uh, to be very... Uh, to be very frank, I found him to be more uh, media friendly with uh, international critics rather than with Indian critics. And I say it here in uh, an open interview to you that I personally feel 
that he was more friendly with uh, Mari Seton and all these people. Because Mari Seton accompanied him uh, to the shooting of, I think, Kanchan Jong, if I'm not mistaken, along with his family, of course. And she wrote a book on it. But I don't think uh, he would allow any Indian uh, critic at that time to accompany him to any shoot. But she was there almost for the entire shoot. And that book is, I, I don't know whether it's out of print. It's a very, very good book where you get uh, the inside story of the filmmaker while he's working, which I didn't get. But I went to his shooting spots also for Mahanagar, I think. Uh, no, not Mahanagar. It's uh, Kapurush Mahapurush. I went for Kapurush shooting. He, he invited me to watch the shooting and I went there. But I wasn't very happy because I don't like all the camera movements and then stopping and then the lights being arranged. It's very boring. It's very, very boring. So I waited, waited there for some time. I saw the cameraman Shubhrata Mitra sitting on top of a crane. And the camera was on, no, not Shubhrata Mitra, Shomendu Roy. He's still alive. He's 80 plus or something, but he's in very bad shape. So this is all I can say about the letters. And very many years later, when I came to Calcutta, just when I came to Calcutta and went back to Bombay and again wrote to him, that was the last letter I wrote to him. And he answered that also. There were, I think there were two more letters, but I don't have them anymore. So Shomaji, there are two things from your answer about Satyajit Ray that I get. One is that mm -hmm. even in his success, even when he became very successful and including in his old age, he would respond personally to every letter. And which is, which is very impressive for someone of his stature. And the second mm -hmm. thing is that he prioritized foreign media. He gave them more importance than domestic media, uh, low, uh, Indian reporters. Yeah. Why do you think that was the case? Uh, because uh, uh, because of my personal feeling is that I have interviewed Minal Shen. I have got of course I couldn't interview because he died before I became a journalist. I've interviewed Tapan Sina several times, and they were all very open, very accessible. I uh, I could not interview Ashit Shen and those people because they had died before I became a journalist, or I was just becoming a journalist, and I was yet to know them very well through their films. But I personally feel that he used to be extra. What should I say? extra accessible to international journalists. I don't know why. Uh, of course, uh, my Calcutta journalist friends say some of the veteran journalists, he would call them and he would talk to them and all that. Um, but uh, I didn't get that impression because uh, he always, when I wanted to go to his house to interview him that time also, he would say no. And when I met him, and he was always surrounded by uh, three or four circles of chamchas, as, you, as we call them. And I would break through that circle and go to him and say, sir, how are you? And uh, I want to interview you. Please, please, please. He said, uh, you already know me so well on a personal level. So what is the necessity? But I took it because it was repeated, repeatedly done to me. I felt that uh, it was an excuse that I know him. If you know a person, it's better to interview. It's easier to interview him right. than if you don't know him. Yeah. Right. Now, so let's is... move to something else that stood out to me from the book. As I read the book, it seemed to me that Satyajit Ray was greatly affected by the Bengal famine of 1943 and the widespread deaths that the famine caused. Could you elaborate on this for the audience? Some people here may not know about the Great Bengal Famine and how and how Satyajit Ray was affected by it. Uh, whether Shotrinja was affected by the Bengal famine, I wouldn't know. But I think he was more impressed by the book uh, written by Bibhuti Bhushan Bhantapathai. Because that was a time when he made the film. The Bengal family had not become such a uh, big subject to be discussed and debated. That happened only after Amartya Sen wrote his book, which was based on the Bengal, uh, which had a separate chapter on the Bengal famine, where he, where he uh, very clearly proved that the Bengal family was absolutely man-made by the British. All right, it was not a natural uh, factor at all. And so many people died because of that. I personally think that at that point of time, there wasn't much discussion on the Bengal feminine. In fact, I came to know of it from this film. And then I read a bit about it, not much. Now I'm reading more. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that he was more impressed because his Patipachali was based on Vibhuti Bhushan's literature. His Aparajita was based on uh, uh, Vibhuti Bhushan's literature. His uh, Opushankshara was based on Vibhuti Bhushan. So he said in several interviews, and I think in his writing also he has mentioned that he liked Vibhuti Bhushan not only because of his, uh, because of the subject of his writing, he also loved the detailed descriptive, descriptive details written. He said that I did not have to write a script also for Pathe Pachali. It, it, the story goes that he didn't write a script for Pathe Pachali because he said the script is there in the book, whether a drop of water falls on a leaf. That is also written in the book. 
where the, where the children are walking towards uh, following that sweet meat seller. That is also written in the book, perhaps. I read it long time ago, so I don't remember now. So he said that it is literature that appeals to me. Of course, I, can, I have written an entire book on how he has transcended Tagore's literature through the language of cinema. That also I have uh, explained very differently. But my personal viewpoint is, I don't think that, because he did nothing on the feminine after that or before that. That was the only film. And many people criticized the film because it was made in color. You know, that was the uh, predominantly black and white, black and white era. Though he did Kanchan Jong and Deva color. Uh, everybody uh, in my own family, those who are very, from, uh, I mean, very seriously discussing films, uh, they said that uh, he shouldn't have done it in color. And uh, veteran critics also said he shouldn't have done it in color because it's on feminine. And feminine should be black and white. But his answer, my answer to that, I don't know what he said. He used to get very angry with critics, of course. And he had answer for every critic, uh, every criticism. He had a very logical answer. So my personal feeling was that he made it in color in order to point out that it was not a natural family. You see the blue clouds, you see the grain fields, you see the farms, they're green and they're very good. And yet you also see, in the, on the other hand, the grains being stocked grains being hidden away and uh, the rationing shops, the ration owners are not uh, putting it out in the shops to sell. The people are not getting rice. Rice is not available at all. It's not the question of rice being available at a price. It was just not available because it was being released for the soldiers who were fighting the war. So uh, I personally don't think he was very much affected by, uh, I don't think he was affected by anything to be uh, making a film on. You know, he made a film on, and then it must have crept inside the film, all these ideas. Like I have mentioned the uh, sex worker thing. It just crept into the film. It was not already there, maybe. And he made us aware of this. And I came to know of it when I saw these films again while writing this particular book. I saw the films again, and I suddenly realized that what is happening now? Uh, he, he, this guy is not going to look for the sex worker in the Shonagachi area or in the red light areas. He is going in the middle class neighborhood. How can a prostitute be living in a middle class neighborhood? Which explains very clearly that by that time, by the time he made Proti Dondi or by the time he made uh, Jono Aronno, um, of course, uh, Oshani Shankit is different. I, I mentioned three films. Uh, by that time, there was, there were regular red light areas like Shonagachi or Harkata Goli, but there was also mainstream prostituting. The middle class women were getting into prostitution. Uh, maybe there was an economic reason and uh, uh, some, some were doing it clandestinely, some were doing it openly. So why the mainstreaming? It, it's a political comment or maybe it's a sociological comment on the uh, position of society at that time, that uh, urban life was maybe very bad or prostitution was an easy way to make money. That is what one of the mothers of the prostitutes must have felt that now she has gone to Singapore and all that. And uh, I've taken an air-conditioned room and all this thing and she's going and brushing air. And she's very proud of the fact that her daughters are sex workers. So I, I, I personally don't think that he was uh, impressed by, he was uh, shocked by the famine. I think he was more impacted by the uh, Vividibushan novel. It was based on, uh, that is my personal viewpoint. Of course, there may be points of difference. So some people may not agree to this. Okay. So uh, it is impressive to me that, you know, what you said, which is that apparently information and knowledge about the famine uh, started with uh, Amartya Sen's book. And then- More or less. Yeah, more or yeah. less. So th that's, uh, that's interesting uh, to know. Now let's move to one part of your book that I found very uplifting. In the book, you talk about this Bengali actor, Tulsi Chakrabarti. You write that he was one of the most talented actors in the history of Bengali cinema, who had been reduced to a very minor comic role and cameos in films for a pittance. Yet Satyajit Ray saw potential in him and picked him to play the main role of his film. Could you share to us something about this something about Tulsi and this aspect of Satyajit Ray's filmmaking? And Tulsi was a brilliant actor much before Shatrita became a director. All right. But he was relegated to comic roles and he got 20 rupees per film. All right. 20 rupees per film. He didn't have children, but he was very, very poor. He used to live in a very small flat in a narrow gully in the north of Calcutta. And uh, uh, there was a lot of writing about him after he was mostly rec internationally recognized for Parish Patel. In Pothet Pachali, 
I don't know how familiar you are with the film. He plays a grocer. In those days, uh, at the time of Pathet Machali, the grocer, the village grocer, the mania uh, in the roadside corner, he also used to run a part shala, you know, where children come to study. So he, I, I have seen this when I was a child myself. You know, they, he runs a part shala where small children come to study, mostly boys come to study, and he used the cane very liberally to beat them up. And they were least interested in studying. So he took Tulshi Chakwat in that very small role in Pathe Pachali, and he felt if I make Parash Patar, he should be the one. And he made such a brilliant theatre. And Tulshi Chakwat, he, he said, I'll pay you 100 rupees uh, for your role in uh, Parush Pathur. And he said, no, 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 I don't want 100 rupees. I don't want 100 rupees. He said, why not? So he thought, you want more? He said, no, 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 no. If you give me 100 rupees, the word will spread around and I'll stop getting roles. <laughs> you know, because everybody pays me 20 rupees. If you pay me 100 rupees, they'll think I charge 100 rupees from everybody. So please don't. And the story goes that uh, after that, when Tulshi Chakwad used to pass uh, Bijoli Cinema, which is very close to my house, where Parush Pathur had, had a very good run, uh, he would uh, fold his hands and uh, do Namaskar because that was, uh, he said, uh, he gave me a new life, which is not correct because uh, Uttam Kumar had acted with Tulshi Chakwati in 26 films, all right? And he used to play very small roles, but you would you would remember him in that small role. He was very famous. And very, uh, the story goes that when Uttam Kumar used to get a role, he, he would always tell his director that, please take Tulshi Dada one of the roles, you know, we, we want him. He's really good. I'll never be so good like him. But unfortunately, he, uh, he was living in a small rented uh, rented apartment in North Calcutta, which was the original Calcutta, with his wife. They did not have children. And uh, uh, slowly, he saved his, uh, he, his wife had saved some money, even from the little money that they had earned. And he gave her the money and she said, why don't you buy this house? So he bought the house they were living in. But later on, because his work started dwindling, they were forced to sell the house and go and live again in a shanty. And uh, days were very bad. And uh, just before he died, he got some money from somebody. And uh, yeah, he went to the market. He would go to the market himself. M many people I've seen earlier on, they would go to the market themselves with the thaili in the hand and bringing fish and all that. So he went to the market and he brought uh, uh, big prawns, king prawns, as you know. And he brought um, uh, some mutton and he had brought rice and he brought, uh, he, he told his wife, come on, quick, get on. I want to have a good feast now. So they had a good feast and that very night he had uh, food poisoning and he died the next day. Unfortunately, his wife remained a widow for 35 years after marriage. And the story goes that she had to beg from door to door. There was no industry person helping her out. She died a beggar. And she lived for 35 years like a baker. This was what the fate of Tulshi Chakraborty ended up in. I read up on this uh, because there's a lot of writing about Tulshi Chakraborty recently in the social media. A lot of interest is there. Uh, but he is one of the greatest actors we have ever had. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I got from the book and from the conversation with you is that Satyajit Ray was influenced a lot by literature from mm -hmm. Bengali literature, from non-Bengali literature, when he came up with ideas for his films. You mentioned Tagore and Munshi Premchand in the book as those whose stories Ray built on. What lessons do you think this offers to filmmakers of today uh, in terms of you know, looking at literature for inspiration and ideas? Uh... Uh, you are asking me or you are asking me the opinion of the directors today? Uh, asking you for your opinion, given based okay. on Ray's work. Okay, okay, fine, 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 fine. Uh, I think uh, Bengali literature especially uh, has a very rich treasury. I don't, uh, I don't think that you need to go write your own script and make an original film. Of course, you are free. It's a democratic country you, and you are an artist. So you have the freedom to write your own script and write your own story. But uh, according to me, I, though I have been born and brought up in Bombay, I have grown up uh, richly enriched by Bengali original literature written in the original. And I feel that uh, the, there are writers and there are books, even now, even today's writers, they are really great. And uh, um, most of many of them do not have uh, the potential to be turned into celluloid. But even then, sometimes the directors take that as a challenge. 
एंड टर्न इट इन टू अ फिल्म इस स्टोरी का फिल्म नहीं बनेगा दिस स्टोरी कैन नॉट बी मेड इन टू अ फिल्म दिस वॉज सेट अबाउट धर्म धर्म शिफ्टिंग लिटिल फ्रॉम बेंगाल धर्मवीर भारती वॉट इज द नेम ऑफ दैट फिल्म सूरज का सातवा घोड़ा you must have heard the name of it that suraj ka i have met dharmveer bharati and i heard him saying that uh, is film ka to is story ka film nahi banega really it was very tough and uh, when i interviewed shami uh, he said that the very reason i took this to make into a film was that it was impossible to make into a film so that became the challenge so literature processes all kinds of challenges you can make a film which uh, is being reportedly said even pothir pa chali it is such a thick book and he broke it up into three parts and he took liberties with the third one and also only no not so much with the second one with the third one he uh, took some liberties because he skipped one character completely leela because he did not get the right actress you know this is the kind of uh, uh, commitment they have towards their art once they have chosen he just cut it out and he was very roundly criticized for cutting out leela's character but uh, he uh, he did not bother he said that no that character doesn't because he did not get a good actress he did not get a good actress and uh, according to me i feel as i did in not in this book in the other book that he had the capacity of transcending literature through the cinematic language he is not opposing or he is not criticizing the writer he is not interpreting the writer he may not be translating the writer but he has tran he can transcend literature Uh, for example, if you remember Charulot, I don't know whether you've seen Charul. I've not mentioned it there. All right, Mohanagar. I mentioned it in the in the book. You must have read it, Mohanagar, the big city. There, uh, this housewife um, uh, becomes a working woman. You know, she is a very middle class, low middle class, you can say, uh, who is forced to who is forced to take up a job, and she is beginning to enjoy it. As she is beginning to enjoying it, her life also changes. She gets an Anglo Indian friend, and the Anglo Indian friend gives her a lipstick. but in the low middle class home she knows that the lipstick will not be welcome so she hides it in her purse and she puts it on only when she reaches office in the um in the lady's toilet and then she removes the lipstick when she just before entering the house but the husband comes to know of it and he just asks oh you wear lipstick so she did not like the tone maybe and she throws the lipstick out of the window so these are things which are not there in the book it cannot be there in the book because but the story was written much before and uh, the change in the story that he made that in the original story avataranika the name of the original story was avataranika authored by narendranath mitra who was a, a, a very very famous post colonial post tagorean writer now he had, for in his story the hero was the husband and shatita just shifted the axis to the heroine to the wife and the whole story wrote itself out in cinema so he could transcribe literature he could express it in celluloid language he could interpret literature he could contradict literature and the best thing he didn't contradict literature but he transcended literature to create his own language through the same so if you read the story and if you watch the film maybe you will find so many differences but they speak their own story their story is different you don't have to all the time compare that is my opinion okay now let me shift the focus from satyajit ray a little to you and my question <laughs> is you told us about growing up in a family that was a family of people who loved films and cinema uh yeah. how did you what what was growing up like how did you when did you decide to write books and become an author uh it's a very long story actually i remember when i was very small my father had a movie camera and a projector all right and he would put up the in the mall, in the daytime on holidays he was a government servant and uh, fortunately in those days government servants were, were not stained like they are now so um, uh, he used to take that movie camera and take us to the beach the beach was very close to our house and he would take those films on the movie camera and in the evening he would come and show it to us there were the, my uncles would tie up a screen in uh, our living room very small living room and we will all sit in the dark and see that i'm crossing the road somebody is trying to i was very small at that time and uh, it, those uh, seeing myself in that film fascinated me and i was only about 4 or 5 years old so it fascinated me it is black and white and then he sold off the movie camera and all those films disappeared uh, from uh, memory and then uh, he made it a practice when i was a little older i still remember he made it a practice on sunday to take me to all animation walt disney films 
all right uh, tom and jerry films charlie chaplin films and i don't know i was not aware at that time but somehow i got very really mesmerized by those films i i have no idea that i become a film journalist or anything like that and then as i started growing up my mother took me to hindi films because i was good in studies and they knew that i'm very fond of films but of course they would also scold me and beat me because i was always running after films and they thought that i was not studying but i was studying i was okay i was just above average i was not standing first or second or anything on getting medals but i was just above average so uh, they couldn't put a stop to it and uh, when i was in college i took up economics honors i don't know why i took up economics honors but i loved it because all my friends were in economics honors and the snobs were in english literature so i did i, I was i was better in literature but i wanted to avoid that snob crowd and my friends were all in economics and i thought i'm a middle class girl after my graduation i'll have to take up a work job in a bank or in the lic in those days getting those jobs were very easy so it's better that i majored in economics and i majored in economics and i also started writing not necessarily on films but on anything because writing was also my passion and i was quite good at it that is what my professors used to tell me and uh, when i was in the when i just graduated and joined my masters degree at bombay university i just crossed the road one day and i entered the office of forum which was edited by joachim alva it was a political magazine edited by joachim alva who was the father in law of uh, margaret alva and the husband of violet alva violet alva was the speaker of the rajya sabha at that time and he was a member of the lok sabha very nice gentleman so he was not there in the office so I, he said um, the secretary said yes he is looking for journalists but um, he wants somebody that to write political commentaries on south africa <laughs> <laughs> that was like space for me so i wrote a very nice letter to him saying that i don't want to write only on films not on political matters i'm absolutely illiterate and definitely not south africa i don't know anything about it so uh, he uh, we didn't have a phone at home so he wrote me a letter and said you still come i'll find something for you so i went and i was just across the road his office was just across the bombay university campus so i went and very nice gentleman he said your handwriting is very good There's, those days we were not write, typing much so we were typing but not much and he said what do you want to write on what are you comfortable with i said i would love to write on films so he said okay i'll start a film page for you so i was fascinated you know and he said i'll give you 14 rupees for the ticket for your mother and yourself because you are not going to go alone you are very young you take your mother with you and watch whatever films you want and write and by he gave me a very good guidance on how to write for example keep a spare uh, type it in uh, double space all right keep uh, give a log line at the top of every page so that i know where to continue because the person who is going to make the page is not me so he should know which is the next page that is page 2 and then write the uh, abbreviation of the title and then i asked him that can i i have to do current films but can i do some retro films also which i love very much he said yes yes go ahead go ahead so i wrote a gone with the wind and i was fascinated with my own way of writing gone with the wind i was 19 years old so i was fascinated with my own journey and uh, my parents were very progressive they didn't say anything i was actually training at that time to be a dancer but uh, they did not stop me I, i did not become a dancer because the dancing world was full of politics very very political and my parents did not have the kind of money to spend on the political part of you know holding conferences and recitals and spending money on the stage and the auditorium and the audience and everything so i just said that let me shift to uh, education so i did my masters and while i was doing my masters i started writing fortunately or unfortunately i got married halfway through my masters <laughs> and uh, all my journalism stopped my dancing stopped everything stopped for one full year though i wanted to finish my masters very badly desperately and my husband said all right go ahead and do it so i came back those days you didn't have distance education and all that so i came back and stayed with my parents for one year i finished my masters and that is the time i really started to write on films and um, and also on my uh, you know small snippets of uh, how as a housewife i'm coping between bombay and calcutta how bombay was and how calcutta is you know for women's magazines and they were letters to the editor but they paid me 20 rupees for the first prize so i was fascinated 20 rupees of my own earning for the first time and uh, mr alva used to give me 14 rupees for two tickets for my mother and myself balcony tickets were 7 rupees and another 20 rupees for the review 
So the, that was a called twin kin's ransom in those days, and I was very thrilled that I'm getting money, and I'm also getting the money for the ticket. So this is how it slowly began. And after my marriage, I must say that my husband once told me that I'm I married you because I thought uh, you're very interested in inter intellectual uh, activity. So what are you doing now? So I said I'm busy with the household because my mother-in-law was there, my father-in-law was there, it was joint family, two brothers-in-law, one sister-in-law to be married. So I got caught up in all that. I was not used to that. And slowly I started writing about that. That's why I am not writing. All right, I started with that. And slowly, slowly, I don't know when I started writing professionally, but I went back to teaching for a very long time. I taught for only 20 years, but after 12 years of teaching, I began writing also professionally. So I did both for 10 years, writing and teaching. I taught economics in a college in Bombay. And um, while I was teaching economics, I was also writing, very prolifically writing. And I write very prolifically for the simple reason that I have a typing speed of 40 words per minute. All right. And I do a lot of research. One day I'll research and the next day I'll write. So uh, uh, gradually, after 10 years, after 13 years of teaching in a college, uh, my husband said, you have to choose between the two. You can't have two professions at the same time. You're also doing the housework. You have, we have our daughter to look after. She was in school at that time in the ninth standard. So you better make a choice. So I chose to quit the college job and I concentrated on, uh, on writing. And uh, I don't regret my choice, though I love teaching. I still love teaching. I do teach, like uh, I teach cinema uh, at certain institutes from time to time if they call me. They don't always call me because I'm not an international cinema expert. And in Cal Calcutta is a very snobbish place. If you look at it beneath the lines, it's very snobbish. It pretends to be very middle classy, but it's not middle classy at all. It's very snobbish. So they don't count me much because they are all intellectuals talking about French cinema and Italian cinema and neorealistic cinema and uh, Japanese cinema. And I am not an expert on that. I'm a student, of course. I watch, but I don't think I have the command to write. It's only after I became a journalist, I started learning Goda. I started to ask people, what does Goda really mean? Uh, I, I started uh, doing all the Italian masters. I watched those films so that I can have it in my head and I learn more, but not to write because there are people who are really writing very well and who have mastered them. I have not mastered them. I don't claim to have mastered any cinema at all because life is entirely a learning process. You're always learning, you're always learning. And then one of my friends, Sanjit Narvekar, he is. Uh, uh, he gave me a book called uh, "From Reverence to Rape, Rape" by Molly Haskell. At that time, it was out of print. So he said, "What are you doing writing journals only? Why don't you write a book? This is a book I'm presenting it to you, and do something like that." And that was the time. Of course, I was writing. I wrote books before that, but that was on gender. On cinema, I didn't have the guts to take up cinema as a subject for a book. So he said, "You read this book, and." See that you write because all your uh, newspaper writings will go, disappear with time. It will not remain. So make something very permanent. So yeah, I, I thought, all right. And I said from Reverence to Rape, where she has studied women characters according to the actresses who played them. For example, there's a chapter on uh, Betty Davis. There's a chapter on Marlene Monroe. There's a chapter on uh, Grace Kelly. There are chapters on actresses. Very well written. Very well written. So I said, I have to do something different. So I did a book on a subject cinema, object woman, a study of the portrayal of women in Indian cinema, which was about the images that they presented, the mythical woman, uh, the divorced woman, the married woman, rape, uh, then the woman in male masquerade, and I really enjoyed writing it. And uh, I was guided a little bit by uh, the late Chidananda Dasgupta, with the, one of the most famous critics I have ever met. And he is Aparna Sen's father. He was Aparna Sen's father. And I gave him the first two chapters. He said, throw it all away. It's bogus. And I felt so disheartened. And he said, it doesn't have a focus. You have to have a focus. And then I slowly developed a focus. And again, there was a big, big block. What was it? No, no publisher was willing to touch that book. They knew me as a gender writer. But nobody, because that was, it, it, technically, it's known as feminist film criticism. But the publishers didn't know that word at that time, in 1998. So I requested my husband, will you publish it? Now, he was very far away from publishing. Uh, he was a civil engineer working in a multinational concern before he came to Calcutta. He took VR and he came to Calcutta. I said, will you please publish it? Nobody's publishing it. I, I promise you, I'll get you back the money. 
So he said, all right, publish it, but you'll have to look after the technical details. I said, I'll do it. Only the, the printing part you have to do because I don't know the printing part. He said, even I don't know. So I said, all right, let us try it out. And my brother, he's a commercial artist. He did the cover for it. Uh, and uh, he said, if you're going to price on it and earn money, you have to pay me for the cover. I said, all right, we'll pay you for the cover because he was a commercial artist. And uh, I looked after the proofs and all that in Bombay. We stayed in Bombay for some time. We had a flat there for a very long time. Then we sold it, of course. And we came back. And the book wasn't a commercial hit. Of course, it wouldn't be. But it's there in many university libraries. So that was my first book on cinema. And now I have 30 books, of which 15 are on cinema. And I don't uh, regret. I have not earned uh, almost any money from uh, writing books. I earn much more as a journalist. Those earnings are also very petty, but because very, very uh, small. But I don't mind because I'm very prolific. I'm writing an article almost every day. So if I don't write for two days, there's a piling up of three articles or four articles, you know. I can't write three or four articles in one day. So it gets staggered. And I don't like me to be staggered. I don't like to keep away from the media for more than one day. I want an article to come out every day. That doesn't happen now because I'm very old also. And I do other work also. So I like I'm doing this Zoom meeting. And uh, I'm judging another competition for journalists. So it becomes very hectic for me, but I enjoy it. I've just Over given the, my, yeah. In the interest of time, uh, I'll yeah, move to you. sort of the last few questions, but I'll yeah, also okay. invite our audience to ask any questions. Please yeah, please, please, please. And, please. and ask yeah, any please. questions you, you might have. I know we are already above time, but uh, yeah. let me ask my next few questions in rapid fire format. Yeah, so I'll okay, ask the fine. questions and you can give a short answer so we can okay, fine, you know, finish fine. in time. Okay. Um, my first question is, who were the writers who inspired you? Writers? Who writers, you're talking inspired? about film critics or authors? Authors. Authors, Rabindranath Tagore, Shorat Chandra Chatterjee, Swamaresh Basu, The Warden Ones, Sunil Gangopadhyay, Shishendra Mukherjee. A bit of Shakespeare because I quoted him very often and I saw his films and wrote about his films. Wordsworth. I loved Wordsworth. Not so much of prose. And uh, I also like the Agatha Christie. I love thrillers. So in Western literature, I read mostly thrillers and short stories by Indian authors also. I read a lot of Indian authors in English. Uh, like Jhumpa Lahiri. All right. Uh, and uh, uh, what is her name? What is his name? Uh, uh, now I have a new friend. His name is uh, Shoikat Mojumdar. He writes brilliant English. Brilliant. He's an Indian. He teaches at Ashoka University in Delhi. But he's a he takes about three, four years to write a novel, but he's brilliant. I, I love these. Then Shashi Deshpande. She's also very famous. Uh, she has written quite a way. She takes a lot of time to write one book, but she's very good. Her language and, is also very good. And these authors you mentioned, like Tagore and others, you've been reading since you were a child? Yeah, yeah. From, uh, from the 8th standard onwards, when I was 12 or 13, my mother introduced me to Bangla reading because I didn't know much of Bangla as I knew English. She said, if you don't know Bengali, you are not a Bengali. So, and I was very interested in reading and learning. So uh, he, she, she, asked, she asked me first to read the books uh, what Tagore had written on small, small children and then slowly his short stories and then his novels. So my father used to, my mother used to censor my reading a bit that this is not for you, you're only 13 years old. My father said nothing to him. Let her draw the conclusion. Let her decide whether she should read the book or not. So my upbringing has been very, very nice compared to the age in which I was born and uh, looking at my friends and all, but it has been very, very progressive. I'm really very, very deeply grateful to my mother and my father. Now, Shomaji, what books are you reading these days? Oh, I write a whole uh, whole lot of books because I'm reviewing book reviews for a famous magazine and they pay very well. So uh, today I finished reading uh, a book on Irfan, uh, Irfan Khan by Anup Singh, who has directed two films of Irfan Khan, very different ones, one different from the other. And I just finished it and it's a brilliant book. Uh, before that, I finished reading... Uh, a portrait of Shrutu Rai by one of his actors called Borun Chondo. That was also very well. Somehow I keep getting books mainly on cinema and I review them and I, I read them and I review them. I enjoy reading them, but now I find it takes a lot of time for me to finish one book. Earlier I used to finish one book in one day or two days. Now it takes me seven days to finish one book. <laughs> and I, I read a lot of contemporary writers and because I'm getting those books. 
So I'm reading a lot of contemporary writings. Shomaji, before I come to my last question, there's a question from Sahana Singh. Sahana, can you unmute and ask? Yes, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Shomadi, I enjoyed listening to you today. You really gave a flavor of uh, uh, Bengali uh, Satyajit Ray cinema and the time, you know, the time that you lived in and you grew up in. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, so my question is related to the portrayal of women characters in uh, race movies. I always mm. found them to be uh, shown very sensitively and, you know, as very compassionate, kind and beautiful beings. Uh, compared to the men, uh, I don't know if I've seen, maybe I've not seen all the movies, uh, but did you also get the feeling that the women were being shown, shown very kindly, you know, like daughters-in-law, they are, you know, they're so dutiful, they do their roles well, uh, or even if they are, you know, prostitutes, you know, they are, you can totally sympathize with the women characters all the time. Uh, do you I, I agree with it, but I don't agree with the fact that uh, the men are not shown uh, well, because even the husband, I don't know whether you've seen Charu Lotha, you hmm. sympathize with the husband also, with Bhupati also. You sympathize with the uh, the husband in uh, Mahanagar also. You know, actually the woman, uh, what he wanted to show, uh, according to me, how much I have studied uh, Shutrit Rai, what has given me, I've written it in the book also, that you cannot reduce his male or female characters to a cliche, to a cliche, all right? Hmm. There is no hero or villain or uh, heroine or uh, vamp in his films and uh, nor are they very perfect human beings and mm. there's a lot of evolution in, and growth within them even in the film and if you think it is more in the woman than in the men i think you are right because mm. in uh, charulata we see she's evolving as a writer and mm. then she falls in love with the brother-in-law and she knows that uh, it, when she learns that it is not being reciprocated she gets a big shock and her husband also knows about it and he feels also sorry but uh, uh, i think uh, they evolve more than the men. The men also evolve. They grow through the film. But the women, I think, grow more. But that can be logically explained away because the women are already set back. They're already unequal in, a, in the world in which they are shown. They are already unequal. For example, in Opur Shankshar, they have a very democratic relationship Opu, with his uh, new bride. But when they are eating, uh, uh, they have a very patriarchal kind of a marriage. But even then, when uh, they are eating, when I love that scene where uh, she, uh, when Opu is eating, the wife is fanning him with the hand fan. And when the wife is eating, Opu is fanning him with the hand fan. So that was a lovely touch showing that there can be equality in marriage. I don't think I have seen that before uh, Opu Shankshar, which was made in the 1959, 58 or something like that. So that was a long time away. And uh, I think the woman may appear to be more powerful, as you have rightly said, uh, and because uh, even the prostitute in uh, John O'Aron, uh, she refuses to admit her name to her brother's friend because she is not wanting the pity or the sympathy of that friend. She's looking at him as an agent, which he actually is, who has got her a customer, a valued customer. So she doesn't want to give out her identity or even acknowledge that, yes, they know each other. The, the man thinks that, yes, I know him. But she says, no, no, you're spelling, giving my name wrong. I am not this. I'm, my name is Jyotika. My name is not Connor. So uh, he, she say, he says, can I turn, turn the car, car back so that I don't have to take you to the grand? She says, no, no, no. If you turn the uh, car back and uh, from the hotel, then uh, you will also lose money. I will also lose money. So let us go straight. She takes a very matter of fact attitude. So if you want to compare the two, maybe they are more, more evolving and therefore they appear more powerful rather than beautiful. I would say that they are more powerful than the men. Even in Pratidondi, the prostitute is more powerful than the hero. The hero is an escapist. In Pratidondi, the rival, the, the name of the film is The Rival. And uh, he is an escapist all the time, escaping from everywhere. And uh, in the end, he wants to go back to his childhood. He's looking for that bird song, which he heard as a child. So I think, that uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, you gave the nuance very well. So Shomaji, last question. What is the next book you're working on these days? Oh, I've just finished it. Nice you asked me this. I finished two books just now. One is into print, waiting for the cover with design to come in, uh, which is called uh, Through the Lens Brightly. It is about nine women film directors, contemporary ones, who are, and how they have represented the women, women in their films. All right. 
women, working women in their films. All of them are working women. I've chosen films which are one film each of each director. And uh, the, the woman in the film is a working woman. She may be a Rudali, or she may be a prostitute like in Talash, or uh, she may be a, a craftswoman like in Parched. Uh, but uh, they're all working. Razi, she, she's a spy, but uh, they're all working women. So that was one study which I enjoyed doing like anything. And just now I've given it, uh, give, written another book, which is which I have tried to counter the theory of uh, Laura Malway, who wrote about the male gaze in 1975. She founded the theory of the male gaze, where she's uh, assuming that the audience is all male and the director is male, the cinematographer is the male and editor is male. So they use the woman's body as the camera, cameratic voyeur. The camera becomes a voyeur. The director is a voyeur. The hero is a warrior and the audience is also a warrior. Now, I wanted to counter that. This is going on since 75. And of course, I do agree that Indian directors have used that. My mainstream cinema do use. But I don't agree with the whole theory that the audience is male. Audience is definitely not fully male. It's based on the assumption. She is not saying that. But it is assumed in her theory that the audience is fully male. Audience is not male. Now, did half the audience almost is female. And some, in some cases for the afternoon shows, or for the afternoon television serials, they're almost all female because men are working outside. The, the second theory which she establishes is um, uh, uh, that uh, hers is a European approach to the woman, looking at the woman as an object of the camera, of the editing uh, uh, machine, of the director. She's an object, but I don't agree because uh, in India, the male gaze is a cultural gaze. It's not necessarily a sensual gaze, not necessarily a titillating gaze. It is a social gaze. When you're looking at the girls walking on the road, you may see that whether she's beautiful or not, but it may not absorb, yeah, yeah, her beauty may not be, uh, may not turn her into an object of your voyeurism. You may begin thinking, ah, oh my God, she's become the middle class. She's holding a bag in her hand. She's running to catch the train. Will she be able to catch the train? This may occur to you because we are culturally different products. So we cannot uh, import that particular Laura Malve theory into the Indian film theory. So I have tried to counter that by studying nine films of nine male directors who have never used the cinema uh, to uh, the camera uh, to view the female character in the films uh, as objects. Like, for example, Vijayanan's Guide. All right. The woman is a very important character. She's a dancer, but the camera never uses it as a subject uh, object. She's used as a subject of the film. Uh, then I have also explained Sai Bibi Gulam. The wife becomes an alcoholic. She's very beautiful, but she is not an object of the. If she is an object of the camera, she's also the subject of the film. It's she's not only an. So this is about the uh, manuscript that has just been given to the publishers. I only hope I live to see the book in publication because they take their own sweet time to publish books. Shomaji, I truly hope that you not only live to see the publication of these books, you also live to write more books. On <laughs> I want to, I would love to, but I don't know. <laughs> on Thank that you note, very much. For Any more questions? No more questions. No. I think we are good for now. On that note, thank you very much. We are already past time, so we'll stop here. Thank you, okay, everyone, thank for you joining us. In yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, for, thank, thank you, with the star. Thank you, Renu. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you, all the uh, audience who had come, the participants who have come, and I really enjoyed this session. I really, really enjoyed this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shomaji, and good luck with your next books. Yeah, good luck to you too. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. We are committed to bringing you in-depth, wide-ranging interviews with authors who write books on interesting topics. If you have suggestions for authors you want us to interview, feel free to share. Our goal is to encourage people to read good books. Remember, books are the best friend we have. Reading good books not only helps us learn, it also helps us think more deeply and more broadly about things. We hope you will read more and keep coming back to join us in our interview series. Have a wonderful day.